Well, it's time for the Week in Review. I'm Dave Morris here in the Oklahoma's Video Studio, joined by For Phil O'Connor and Don Mikoy from the Oklahoma's Newsroom. Gentlemen, welcome back from the holidays. Let's get back in the habit of recapping uh, the week that was, right? Yep. Can't wait. And by the way, how were your holidays? Pretty good. Got yeah. to see my team lose another bowl game. It's pretty much what we do this time of year. But you had a good time in Memphis, had watching Kansas Memphis. State, right? Had a great time in Memphis. It's uh, some good barbecue up there. A lot of good barbecue. Don, how were your holidays? It was great too. Uh, uh, OU also had a similar experience in their bowl <laughs> game, but uh, you know, everybody knows about that. Well, that's right. The national championship game will be uh, this coming Monday. Our Barry Trammell, you can follow his travel blog. He's already made it to the Camelback Inn out in Scottsdale, beautiful Scottsdale, where it's raining on his parade, is what he wrote today. Oh is that him and uh, Trish the Dish like their time in Scottsdale, but it's raining on them today. Today, though, we're talking about earthquakes, education, and energy, three of the big topics from the past week, some of the headlines you saw in the Oklahoman and on your favorite website, newsok.com. Phil, we'll start with you with education. Budget woes as a result of perhaps some energy companies' problems, meaning less tax revenue that uh, led into some of this. Joy Hoffmeister yesterday said uh, school districts could be forced to close some of the doors in some districts as a result of $47 million in funding cuts due to the state's budget crisis. Yeah, and it's bad news on a at a time when the district, uh, when the state is already struggling with the issue of teacher pay and a lot of other issues confronting education. Um, this is a big hole in a big budget, and uh, the issue of closing schools is probably one of the most contentious that Oklahoma ever confronts. Um, the, whenever you're talking about uh, taking the, what is often the livelihood of many small communities and shutting it down, I mean, these are the jobs for teachers, these are the jobs for uh, secondary positions in those institutions. It's a big hit on local communities whenever you talk about closing schools. Because it then becomes more work, and you're looking at B-roll from uh, yesterday's uh, uh, Board of Education meeting, Hoffmeister addressed some of the cuts. In fact, last night she spent quite a bit of time on Twitter answering uh, a lot of questions that perhaps some of the teachers and parents and members of our community have. Um, and uh, she was pretty frank in some of her answers, but uh, that's something that we do well in the newsroom is getting on Twitter. Of course, Steve Lackmeyer loves to hold court when he's answering questions from uh, those in the community, and she did a good job last night. And Yesterday she was addressing some of those questions. Yeah, we'll have a story in this weekend's paper, too. Uh, it's a continuing look at our skills gap issue here in uh, Oklahoma and the issue of having a workforce that will be um, ready to compete in the coming decades. And uh, so a story that Catherine uh, McNutt's doing this weekend will look at the issue of the shortage of math and science teachers in the state and uh, why it's so difficult to fill those positions, uh, critical positions. Another headline this week involves Sandridge Energy, and Don will bring you in. Don is the business editor of the Oklahoma here, and Sandridge uh, was delisted by the New York Stock Exchange this week. Yeah, it was a little bit of a surprise because Sandridge had been warned by the New York Stock Exchange months ago, last summer, that they were in danger of being delisted because their stock price had been below a dollar for a long time, and, and that's one of the requirements. Well, Sandridge had come up with a plan to do a reverse stock split so that you have fewer shares, but each share is worth more money and that would have gotten their stock price back over a dollar. They were going to do that at this year's shareholders meeting. And the New York Stock Exchange had said, that sounds like a good plan. And a that shareholders meeting was set for November, right? Uh, well, initially, and then they, they, they postponed it into, into 2016. But uh, uh, the stock price got so low, apparently, it got down to 15 cents a share, that the New York Stock Exchange just said, we're going to go ahead and delist you. And they did. And Sandridge had the option to challenge that and uh, they, they opted not to appeal, and so the other, uh, they trade over the counter, which is where you see penny stocks, and that's basically what Sandridge has become. Their, their stock, uh, last time I looked, was selling for less than 10 cents a share. And it once traded for? Uh, over $60. Yeah, I believe a couple of years ago, that was the height of it, it was over oh, yeah, $60. Several years ago. Don, what's the state of Sta Sandridge Energy from, for, for people in the community who might want to know, hey, I heard the delisting. Uh, you know, I'm hearing other rumblings about oil being below $35 a barrel, I believe, this week. Uh, what might you think from your perspective? Well, Sandridge has several problems. They've got a lot of debt. Uh, they are really focused. A lot of their assets, most of their assets, are in what's called the Mississippian Formation, which is in northern Oklahoma, uh, which produces a lot of oil, but unfortunately produces a great deal more water and then they have to dispose of that water. Well, that's become a problem because these disposal wells have become linked with the swarms of earthquakes that we've been having, and a lot of these directives that have come from the state regulators about closing these disposal wells or, or reducing the, the capacity that you're pumping in there have been directed at wells that Sandridge uses. And they had been complying with those orders until just recently, last month, there was an order, a directive that was issued by the Corporation Commission 
and they opted not. They said, we're not going to follow that directive. So that's an issue for them as well. Uh, the stock has gotten so cheap that there's almost no value there for shareholders anymore. But it doesn't necessarily mean that the company is going to go out of business, that they're going to go bankrupt. I mean, those are, those are all possibilities. But when you look at their balance sheet, they do have a ton of debt, but they've pushed it out several years. So they, they've done a lot of different things to kind of handle their debt. Uh, and, and oil companies, it's a very volatile business. It's very cyclical. Uh, they know there's going to be downtimes. And so they've, in, some, in the ways that they can, they have prepared for this. And, uh, you know, we don't expect, we well, don't know for sure, we don't expect they're going to be running the bankruptcy court uh, in, in the coming days. Uh, but they, they still have a lot of assets. They still have some cash on hand. They still have some liquidity to, to handle the things that they need to handle. So uh, things look bad, but I don't know that they're tragic at this point. I mean, it, it would be a big blow to Oklahoma City and to downtown if Sandridge was to leave. They employ a lot of people. Uh, they, they sponsor a lot of things. They're, they're well regarded within the community. So uh, Sandridge has some problems. It remains to be seen if they're overwhelming or not. It's a good response to that question and some good analysis, a good look at uh, the situation in Sandridge versus just saying, oh my goodness, the sky is falling on them. It is a cyclical business. Don mentioned the earthquakes. Um, one of the things we heard at the end of last year was the Corporation Commission was going to come back with uh, perhaps some policies and on Monday we did hear from the Corporation Commission. Right, the Corporation Commission has been the lead agency that has been dealing with the response to earthquakes and what they've been doing is when there's a swarm in a particular area they look at the disposal wells where they pump all this water back into the planet <clears throat> excuse me and they issue directives to the operators of those wells and, and they've been doing that regularly there's over 150 disposal wells in Oklahoma that they have issued directives on saying you either need to cut back cut back by 25 percent or 50 percent or you need to shut down this well for a while and they've had uh, the, the industry has responded to that they have for the most part, uh, done what they've been asked to do. Uh, Sandridge being the example of the company that said, we're, we're not going to follow this particular directive. So uh, they also, going all the way back to last spring, the Corporation Commission looked at this formation that they pumped this water into, which is called the Arbuckle, which is very deep and goes all the way down to there's like a granite, what they call the basement. And they looked at wells that went all the way down to that basement and they said, you need to plug those wells up farther so they're not so deep and there have been hundreds more wells that the industry has reacted to those uh, 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 directives and has responded and, 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 and there, late last year we saw, we heard that there was some improvement in the areas where they had issued these directives there had been fewer earthquakes but a lot of that stuff's kind of gone out the window the last couple of weeks because we've just had almost continuous swarms of earthquakes up north and of course we had the big ones in Edmond and uh, so uh, it, it continues. We, we don't know, you know, even, even the experts are kind of shrugging their shoulders and saying, We're, this is all a learning experience for us. It's never happened before. You know, you look at Oklahoma's recent history and in, in, in the last few decades, we had very few earthquakes and now we have a great number of earthquakes more than any other state in the Union. Don mentioned the swarm of earthquakes that we have and behind us is a map that you can find on newsok.com. It's an interactive map. It tracks all the earthquakes of 2.5 or larger magnitude, and there's the full screen version of that. 3.3 uh, was the latest one it has there at 12.43 p.m., but as we all get email alerts now from the USGS and the Oklahoma Geological Survey, there was another earthquake uh, over 2.5 here recently, and that'll be updated on the map here shortly as well. You can find that at newsok.com earthquakes, and in fact, you can participate by submitting your location uh, we heard from the governor earlier this week. She felt it, and she, her comment to the Corporation Commission was that they should update their policies as new issues happen, such as back-to-back -back earthquakes, which we felt the other night. Yeah, and uh, tomorrow we'll have a story about an artist who was inspired by the earthquakes. Uh, Adam Kemp spent some time with him today. Uh, he wrote a orchestral piece that he is teaming with 100 high school students to perform. So um, look for that story tomorrow in the paper. Adam Kemp was there this morning on the campus of OU. I believe Greg Singleton was there working with him on this story. And 
there were some incidents that happened while they were. So I hear yeah. six earthquakes during the during the practice session that they were at. So Phil, what else you got coming up this weekend? Um, today we had Alton Nolan, the uh, person accused in the beheading in uh, Moore at the food plant. There um, was uh, uh, had his preliminary hearing this morning and was bound over for trial on first degree murder charges. So we'll have more on that tomorrow. Um, we have the story Sunday about the uh, math and science teacher shortage. And then uh, Randy Ellis will also be looking at more problems with the Oklahoma City VA and this time involving a program that was uh, uh, meant to give veterans an opportunity who live in remote areas to get health care closer to, their, to where they live. And uh, apparently the VA stepped in and tried to make that a little bit more difficult than necessary. That story by our Randy Ellis coming up this weekend. Don, one last question for you from the business desk. What are you guys working on? Uh, our Steve Lackmeyer is uh, took a tour of the uh, what's about to become the 21C Museum Hotel uh, over on Film Row. It's it's in the 100-year-old Ford assembly plant it's over there. Great-looking building. It's a fascinating still. building, yeah. And and they've been in there working. They still have a lot to do. But we got to take a tour along with the CEO of the company, the 21C company, which if you've seen any of their properties, they're fascinating places. They're they're nice hotels, but they're also museums that are open 24 hours a day. So uh, in the not too distant future, sometime this year, I think, uh, that, that should be opening up here in uh, west of downtown and uh, we get a sneak peek. 21C features a red penguin. Who knew? I learned that from you know, some of the footage that we uh, received from the Louisville uh, 21C. You can follow Steve Lackmeyer's uh, chat. He chats every Friday, 10.30 a.m. on NewsOK.com. That transcript, always well read. You can find it in its entirety right now on NewsOK. Guys, thanks so much for your time and the analysis. Appreciate it. These stories and more in upcoming editions of The Oklahoman and online at NewsOK.com. Have a great weekend, guys.